Um, so I'm going to start with the topic of gravitational lensing, which was mentioned briefly in the first lecture. Uh, I'm presenting it as a case of identical twins. Uh, as you very well know, in many iconic Hindi films, these twins are separated at birth. And then at some later time, they meet each other and various interesting things happen. And that's exactly what happened in 1979. Uh, this number happens to be uh, the way astronomical objects are often referred to, because there are millions of millions of them. Uh, so one just has to give their coordinates. So here's the picture which got everyone so excited. So this is a galaxy, this diffuse thing here is a galaxy. And uh, these two images uh, uh, were identified from the spectrum as objects which were behind the galaxy because the spectral lines were shifted more to the red, which means the Doppler shift was more, which means uh, because of the expansion of the universe, these objects were behind the galaxy. Okay? Uh, because they could also measure the spectrum of the galaxy. But what is unusual? is that these two objects had virtually identical spectra. And these are what are called quasars. I won't be able to tell you much more about them, except that they represent a very energetic phenomenon around a black hole in the center of a galaxy, which can emit in all regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and it's a remarkable coincidence if the ratio of what is being emitted across the entire electromagnetic spectrum is identical for these two objects. Okay. Now, uh, people had for a long time been looking for uh, gravitational lenses. Okay? And uh, finally, this was welcomed as a long soft up, sort of a gravitational lens. And uh, we'll be talking about the optics of these objects. Uh, so there's a lot of evidence now that uh, these two are really one object. And there are multiple ray paths, uh, both of which satisfy Fermat's principle, as it turns out, which uh, reach you as the observer. Okay. Uh, I put the word lens in quotes because as we'll see very quickly, it's not a very good lens. So before, uh, this is the uh, radiation from the quasar before it encounters the galaxy. And it's a nice diverging uh, set of rays uh, represented by a convex spherical wave field. Okay. Um, so here's the galaxy. Uh, I'm just showing it as a blob of dark matter. And that's pretty much, if you're interested in the mass distribution of the galaxy, this dark matter can be six or seven times the visible matter in stars. Again, that's a point of astronomy which we need not go into. So just think of this as a distribution of matter which is more concentrated in the center. And our best belief is that this matter is in the form of some elementary particles. Okay. So what happens to these rays when they pass near this mass? Uh, well, uh, Einstein told us long ago that they get bent. Okay. And uh, here's the Einstein formula for the bending of light. Okay. Uh, you have Newton's constant, of course, gravity. Uh, and if you have a ray which passes the center at a distance b, okay, so b is what uh, people often call impact parameter, huh? the closest approach of this line uh, to the center, then there's a certain mass which is enclosed inside the cylinder of radius b. And that's the mass which is effective in uh, deflecting the ray. Okay? So the deflection is proportional to the mass. Then you have the square of the velocity of light. And it's inversely proportional to this impact parameter. So once the ray is well outside the galaxy, uh, even if you increase B, this mass is not going to increase. Mass inside the cylinder. But this B is going to increase. So once you're outside the galaxy, the deflection is going to decrease. Okay. Uh, but inside, if you go through the center, this m of b is actually zero. Okay, and and even near the center, m of b is proportional to b squared, so the deflection is small. Okay, so after the deflection, uh, this is what the rays would look like. Uh, the rays which pass far away would be deflected, and the ones which are further away will be deflected less. They are all being uh, deflected downwards, but these still seem to be diverging, whereas the rays close to the center. Are converging now, right? Because the deflection is enough to reverse the curvature of this wavefront. So once you have a set of rays, you can draw a wavefront perpendicular to that. And here it is. So this brings out the basic feature. 
that you have convergence near the center and then uh, somewhere it changes over to uh, a diverging set of rays. After all, the original set of rays was diverging, right? So when it's very far away from this galaxy, it definitely be diverging. So this is a somewhat peculiar wavefront. If you want a good lens, you would like the wavefront to be spherical so that all the normals to the sphere, the radii converge at the center, which is the focus. But now uh, we have the task of understanding a bad lens. Okay. And the question is what happens? Now, uh, people had studied bad lenses because however good you make a lens, it will have some defects. So this was called the field of aberrations. But uh, aberration in normal usage means something which is unusual. But if you have a natural lens, which has not been manufactured to produce a spherical wavefront, a spherical wavefront is an aberration, actually. <laughs> so, uh, so let's try and understand what's going on here. Uh, now, so this is this wavefront, same wavefront, but I have followed it till the central region has almost focused. So uh, just to uh, maybe, yeah, maybe go back, right? The central region has a high curvature, so that will focus first. And then the later regions, the pairs of rays will cross later. That's what's going on. So you can see that these rays are crossing here. But if you take rays which are a little further away from the center, they are crossing at a later point. These are crossing at a still later point and so on. And uh, this is a figure which has been drawn quantitatively. Uh, and I've chosen this shape to be something like a hyperbola, which is highly curved here, but it becomes just almost a straight line here and here. Huh? So notice that uh, in the original wavefront, before it came here, the rays had chosen to be equally spaced. So the intensity was uniform. But already you can see the intensity is more here, the number of rays uh, which are packed in a unit distance is more. And you can see there's a very high intensity along these two curves. Uh, and they are what are called caustics. Okay. Now we are used to the word caustic in chemistry as caustic soda. And in, uh, well, in <laughs> common conversation, someone's being very caustic. If, you know, they make remarks which make others very uncomfortable. But the fundamental meaning in all cases, including in optics, is that it's something which is burning. Okay whether burning you with embarrassment or with chemistry or with concentration of rays. Okay? So more mathematically, if you have a family of rays like this, under some conditions, you can find a curve, which is not a straight line, uh, even though the individual rays are straight, which is what we call the envelope. Envelope is a curve which is tangent to these rays. So the main feature you see is that if you're within the caustic, you have three rays through a given point. So in fact, a lot of effort was put in the object to find the third image. And I, it is some evidence that they found it. It just happens to be very faint. Okay. And then as you move toward the caustic, you can see the angle between two of the rays is decreasing. The third ray is coming from somewhere else. But the two rays which are tangent to the caustic or nearly tangent to the caustic, right? Uh, the angle between them decreases and the intensity increases. So if you are living now, if this is a gravitational lens and the observer happens to be here, the observer will see two very bright images, right? uh, which is separated by a small angle and one fainter image, which is coming from a much larger angle. Okay? Now, one does not have to go to gravitational lenses to see caustics. Uh, now, in the original poster, we promised you experiments and computer simulations, which became a little difficult under the COVID conditions. Nevertheless, uh, I managed to do one experiment at home. Yeah, here it is. Um, of course, the rays uh, also have a vertical component. But if you just look at the component in this horizontal plane, you can see they get bounced off this and they form this uh, caustic. Uh, it's not as sharp as in the uh, figure. But uh, uh, if you just try to do some by computer, same problem. Uh, reflection from a spherical mirror of a parallel beam, we have all been taught that uh, the rays focus at half the center of curvature. But we really cheated you when we told you that in class. So here's a better sketch. Now, uh, the, I have not drawn the incident rays because you're supposed to assume that they are all parallel. And the mirror is a semicircle like this, or a hemisphere in three dimensions. So now uh, you have 
all these parallel rays, uh, which have come from below, I've only drawn half the rays. I've not drawn the rays from above. And the rays which hit, uh, which are very close to the axis, indeed do go to, you know, the center of the circle is somewhere here, this is half. So they approximately get focused here. But as you go further and further away, uh, it's less and less true. So for example, a ray which is coming somewhere here at 45 degree incidence will bounce off at right angles and will be tangent to this cos tangent. So this is not the full figure. The full figure will be obtained if I also include the rays which come from the top and bounce off and come to the bottom. So that's what I've done in the next figure. And actually this figure is very interesting. If someone wants to follow it up as a project, you can. Because the rays which come very close to nine, uh, grazing incidents will bounce many times. So you actually have multiple caustics. And even with the pickup, you can see more than one. So this is just to convince you that caustic is not some exotic phenomenon. It's a very natural phenomenon. The artificial phenomenon is when all the rays come to a point, which is why you pay so much for a good camera or for a good camera in a mobile phone or something like that. Okay. Now to uh, go deeper into this, whatever I've told you is quite qualitative. Uh, we will go back to our optics mechanics analogy. And since we have uh, gravitational lensing in mind, uh, that's a case where the angles made by all the rays uh, are really very small. So for example, in that object which I showed you, the angular separation of those two images is some six or seven arc seconds. Okay? So uh, we will initially confine ourselves to a family of rays which is nearly parallel. But nearly parallel doesn't mean it's trivial because however small the angle is, if you travel a large distance, then the rays can cross and that's exactly what happens. Right? <laughs> In fact, as a small side remark, if you buy a mirror and you want to test how good it is, a plane mirror, uh, you stand in front of it and of course it will show you a nice picture of your face, then keep walking away. And if the mirror has any slight deviations from plane, uh, at some point you will start seeing your face highly distorted and you go still further, it may be upside down and so on. So just because these rays are nearly parallel, please don't think that we won't see interesting optical phenomena. We will. So this x-axis is this axis uh, to which all the rays are nearly parallel. The y-axis is perpendicular to that. And initially, we won't worry about the z-axis. Okay, We'll just look at x and y. So this is just a reminder. Uh, and the way we are going to think about uh, this ray is, we have the x-axis, we draw a number of planes uh, perpendicular to the x-axis. So x has one value on this plane, x has a value x plus delta x on this plane. And the ray at any given plane intersects it at some height y okay, from the axis. And of course, it's not enough to tell me that the ray is at y. If you want to know, you also have to know where it's going. So you give this angle theta, right? Uh, sorry, uh, this is a mistake. It's not at this uh, position, uh, theta is a function of y. So if you have another ray at a different value of y, it could have a different value of theta. But for this ray, right, uh, uh, when it goes to the next plane, all right, because of this angle, uh, it now intersects it in a different place, y plus delta y. So uh, you can write down some very simple relations. Right? Uh, Delta y by delta x is just theta. It's actually tan theta, but remember theta is very small. Okay. Now this is the relation on which we spent the entire uh, second lecture. Namely, uh, if there's a refractive index, and now we are discussing it in general, okay. um, then uh, there is a, a curvature, and curvature is the rate of change of theta with respect to distance traveled along the axis. And that curvature is the derivative of uh, log of n, but now with respect to the direction perpendicular to the ray, y. So this is the relation that uh, we uh, discussed quite a bit last time in the context of the mirage. So this is the optics side of the optics mechanics analogy. Now let's look at the mechanics side. Now the uh, mechanical system, which is analogous to our optical system, is actually a particle moving in one dimension, y. But the role of the other dimension, x, is taken by time. 
So at some point, at some moment of time, the particle is at a distance y from the origin and it's moving with some velocity vy. So at a later time, its y coordinate changes by an amount proportional to vy. Right? So that's similar to this, except the analog of theta is now played by the velocity along the y axis. Okay? And then this velocity is not going to remain constant because if there's any force acting on it, right? So, uh, So, in fact, this is exactly the way you would solve the dynamics problem on the computer. You would assume a small time step delta t, and someone has to give you the value of both y and vy. Okay? So, once you know the value of vy, you can increment y by vy into delta t. In this small interval, uh, treating vy as a constant is a, a good approximation, which gets better and better as we make the interval smaller and smaller. But at the same time, when if we, we don't want to keep vy constant for the next step, because some force has been acting. So the change in by is, this is just Newton's second law. Force divided by mass into delta t. And we'll also take the next step of writing this force as a derivative of uh, a potential, which depends on y. And there's this minus sign. And uh, since we are looking at velocity and force per unit mass, this is also potential per unit. So this is the optics mechanics analogy, right? Uh, theta is analogous to Vy, and log n is analogous to minus the potential per unit. Now, uh, this is, as I said, the form of dynamics, which is uh, convenient for putting on a computer. It's a pair of first order differential equations. Right? dy dt is Vy, and dvy dt is the gradient of some potential. And Depending on which problem you have in mind, this could be a different kind of function of y. So for harmonic oscillator, it will be proportional to y and, and so on and so forth. Of course, so this incidentally, this first order form of dynamics, uh, apart from being suited for computers, we'll see in the very next slide, is also a very nice way of thinking of dynamics. Okay? But if you want to see the Newton's law form, this is what it looks like. And that's obtained simply by substituting uh, here we had the derivative of y, and then so we just differentiate this once more, and uh, d squared we, y by dt squared gives this. And what's the, so now let's come back to optics. So what's the corresponding equation optics? d squared y dx squared is, uh, there is a sign change, yeah? log n by dx. And this is just our relation uh, between the curvature of the ray and the transverse gradient of the refractor. So this is a more or less a recapitulation of what you've already seen. But now, uh, the deeper lesson is that both in optics and mechanics, you should really not think of just position. You should think of position and velocity in mechanics. You should think of y and theta in optics. And this pair of objects is a better way of characterizing what the system is doing. Because if I simply tell you I'm holding a, you know, I have a particle at some point y, uh, you are not going to solve the problem. Someone has to tell you with what velocity that particle is being thrown. Okay. So therefore, uh, the state of the system is whatever information you need in order to predict the future, assuming that you know the potential of force. So the uh, state is best described by this pair of numbers. And if you want to think of the state in a geometric fashion, you should plot this pair of numbers in a space, which is called phase space. Okay. That's what it's called in mechanics. And that's what we are going to call it in optics as well. So now, uh, conceptually, uh, we have the x-axis. We have a number of planes perpendicular to the x-axis at different values of x. And we think of, though it's x is not time, but we think of the state of the ray at a given value of x by giving the height above the plane and angle with respect to the axis. Okay. And we will actually be using this phase space as we go along to understand caustics, gravitational lens, and so on. So, just like you have to know the potential here, you have to know what the refractive index is. Uh, now, some of you may be a little worried, what's the refractive index in gravitational lensing? Um, so, this is a rather subtle point of uh, general relativity. Uh, if you are an observer very uh, sitting right inside the galaxy, you will just see uh, light traveling at uh, C. So, there's no refractive index. However, uh, if you set up some set of coordinates, not Cartesian coordinates, in those coordinates, 
uh, it will appear as if uh, the apparent velocity is governed by refractive index. I'll just say that much and leave it at that. So now uh, the basic idea is that we are going to think of uh, any object, whether it be a galaxy or a lens, as transforming uh, the phase space. Okay. So, uh, in fact, we are not going to solve any complicated differential equations. So, first, let's just look at propagation through a distance x. What happens? So, I don't even need a figure here, I think. Theta remains the same. It's rectilinear propagation. If it, I should have added rectilinear propagation by x. But y increases by actually x tan theta, but we'll call it x into theta. So theta is constant and y increases by x into theta. And since we have decided to look at phase space geometrically, this is what the transformation would look like. Now I'll have a lot of phase space diagrams, so I won't even label the axes. The horizontal axis is always y, the vertical axis is theta. Okay? So, uh, so if you have, so what do you mean when you say theta is constant? It means that the uh, under propagation, you start with any point in phase space, any rate will move horizontally as x increases. However, the speed at which it moves depends on theta. Right? So that's why I have drawn very short arrows at a small value of y. Hmm? Okay. Uh, sorry, at a small value of theta, right? the vertical coordinate. And if you increase theta, the rate at which this moves increases. And of course, if theta is negative, right? In free propagation, what happens? If uh, theta is negative, right? Then y will decrease. Right? Uh, I, I, I don't think I, I don't think we need a figure for that, right? If theta is negative, y will keep decreasing. So the transformation in phase space is what geometrically is called a shearing transformation. If you have a kind of square, it will become parallelogram. Hmm? That is, uh, this base will move to the right, but uh, the upper part of the square will move by a greater amount to the right. Hmm? But please note that the area will remain the same. Okay? That's a property of shear. Now, the other uh, transformation which we will look at is a thin lens. By the way, you might worry, is the gravitational lens a thin lens? After all, it's hundreds of thousands of light years in size. But the point is that uh, we are talking of rays which traverse a distance of uh, billions of light years. So 100,000 is not much. Okay, So it is actually a thin lens. But right now, we are not talking of a bad lens. Let's talk of a good lens. Now, a good lens, uh, no matter what the value of y is, is supposed to send it through the focus. Right? Focal length is there. You can easily convince yourself that for this, theta has to change by minus y by f. So the higher y is, you have to deflect by a greater amount. So this is y, this is f, this is theta, and this is also theta, right? And minus because it's focusing. If y is positive, you want to send it down. If y is negative, you want to send it up. So this is also a shearing transformation, except it's now a shear like this, right? So uh, if uh, y is zero, which is everywhere, on this line, remember this is the y-axis, huh? sorry, sorry for that. This is the axis of y, this is the axis of theta. And uh, of course, if y is zero, uh, I mean, then that ray uh, passes through the lens without deviation, we know that. But the ray uh, which passes at some value of y will be deviated downwards, right? And a larger value of y will be deviated more downwards, likewise. So this is the transformation uh, which occurs. Y remains constant and theta changes by minus y. So these are both shears and this also preserves area for the same reason. If you take a small square, this will now be conserved and uh, this will move by a different amount but the height will be conserved. So now we'll, before using these transformations on gravitational lenses, let's use these transformations on something a little more familiar. So before that, uh, one of the advantages of phase space is you don't have to trace single ray by single ray. If you have a family of rays, then you can uh, think of all the members of the family at the same time and apply a transformation to them. Now, uh, perhaps by mistake, 
have actually labeled the vertical axis as py, like momentum. But this is nothing but theta, all right? It's just that I must have had the optics mechanics analogy in mind. So I labeled by momentum, okay? But phase space is really in mechanics, a space where coordinate is on the x-axis and momentum is on the y-axis. So now, uh, so let's look at uh, different, uh, so you have this uh, blue line, uh, which is vertical. Okay? So what does that correspond to in terms of a family of rays? Uh, vertical, uh, so this has, uh, let's see, there's a range of theta, but there's only a single value of y. Okay. So that's what it is. So, I mean, this is the plane at which we are looking at the rays. They all have the same value of y above, but they have a range of theta. In fact, in this case, theta goes from plus value to some minus value. So this is really a, a focus. That's what this vertical blue line is. Now if you have this diagonal line, uh, I, whatever color, color it is, yeah. Uh, I think it's probably green, right? Now what does this correspond to? Just concentrate on this line. If I, uh, of course we still have this point which is a ray uh, going along the axis, right? Going parallel to the axis. So theta is zero, y is zero. But as I increase uh, the value of y, uh, I move perpendicular to the axis, theta keeps increasing, right? So it's a diverging beam. Or you can also think of it as a spherical wave front like that. Then let's look at this uh, sort of golden horizontal line, okay? So this is now a case where uh, everything has the same value of theta, but uh, they occupy some range in y. So it's a parallel beam. And finally, if you have this one, probably orange. Now you have a situation where if I make y positive, uh, theta actually goes negative. Right? So if starting from this ray, if I go up, the ray points down, next one it points down. So this is the converging beam. So I hope when you see various curves in phase space, just by looking at the slope of that curve, you will realize what is happening to the beam. So we are now going to look at uh, something which is uh, very familiar. It's a telescope. So, and, uh, okay. so, yeah. So this is the first lens called the objective. And instead of looking at just one parallel beam, that's what we usually do, right? Uh, suppose the telescope is looking at the sun. Now, sun subtends a finite angle, right, about uh, half a degree. So, uh, so if you look at this uppermost ray, all these three are a parallel beam coming from the top edge of the sun. Then the three middle rays come from the center of the sun, and the three rays come from the bottom of the sun. Okay. And what happens to them after they go through the telescope? Telescope is supposed to give you a magnified image. Right? This is the eyepiece. So the angle between these has increased. Okay. And uh, you know very well that the length of this is supposed to be f1 plus f2 and so on. So let's see how this looks in phase space. So to prepare you for phase space, I've drawn a large number of diagrams in all of which uh, this is the theta axis and this is the y axis. Okay. So this, uh, set of beams, which is uh, entering the objective, uh, if you look at it, it has some extent half a degree in the theta axis and the extent along the y axis is the diameter of the objective. Okay. So that's what it looks like. And what is a converging lens going to do? We saw earlier, it's going to push this down and it's going to push this up. So it's going to, so immediately after the objective lens, the situation will look like this. So somewhere here, so all I have done is I have sheared, I've taken this rectangle and sheared it, push this up, push this down, and uh, the push is proportional to uh, y. And of course it has the opposite sign to y. So this is the situation when you're here. Now you allow the rays to propagate. So now, uh, free propagation we have seen is going to be a transformation of phase space in which the upper half of phase space moves to the right, positive theta uh, moves to increasing y, and negative theta moves to decreasing y. 
but again it's continuous and uh, uh, zero theta uh, stays the same so after it travels some time in fact after it travels to the focus of this first lens in our normal understanding of optics we would say that that's where you form an image of the sun okay it's not a good place to be <laughs> it'd be very hot and uh, uh, what our phase space picture tells us is that uh, this moves to the right this moves to the left and that's how you end up with this uh, shape and i've drawn it uh, somewhat carefully so that uh, i have moved this to the right but i have moved this to the right by a smaller amount because uh, it's at a smaller value of uh, y a small, sorry smaller value of theta so uh, for example these are the rays at positive theta which came from the top of the sun and now they are here and now they are here and these rays have now come to a focus because now we have a vertical line they are all at the same value of y but different values of theta and similarly the rays coming from each part of the sun have come to a focus but of course our telescope does not stop there no we have to move from here up to the eyepiece so uh, this uh, shearing transformation continues and this is what uh, the phase space picture looks like just before the eyepiece and what is the eyepiece do eyepiece is also a converging lens uh, is shorter focal length of course and therefore it pushes the right hand side down and pushes the left hand side up so after doing that this is the phase space and notice uh, the top of uh, this which was raised from the top of the sun became this became this became this and now it has gone to the bottom so the telescope is actually inverted right and you notice uh, the area is conserved uh, right but uh, what the telescope has done is it has reduced the extent in y because i piece is smaller than the objective and it has increased the extent in theta which means it produced a magnified image and it has uh, it is uh, the fact that the area is conserved is something that is sometimes not emphasized in elementary courses but that's actually rather important if you are collecting solar energy the fact that this area is conserved means that there's a limit to uh, after all uh, the sun is half a degree at most you could stretch it out to plus or minus 90 degrees right so that tells you that you can concentrate sunlight up to a limit you can't concentrate in more than that and uh, in, that limit has a significance you cannot achieve a significant temperature higher than the temperature of the sun okay so this is what we have learned by studying the phase space view of a telescope which is made up of two good lenses and one of the problems i have given you is to work this out quantitatively for a galilean telescope or even for both kinds actually as it turns out so i hope you'll have time to do that and if you want to go back to your familiar ray picture this is what it's like uh by the way uh, many textbooks have this wrong picture that they have an image here and then they force the rays to go through the uh, eyepiece they actually bend the ray but there's no, if there's no lens here that won't happen so the fact is that some of the rays actually do miss the eyepiece and that fact is included in our phase space diagram right if your eyepiece is only this much small amount it will miss these rays and this rays on the other hand you can make a bigger eyepiece then what you will find is one edge of the eyepiece will be seeing only part of the sun and the other edge will be seeing the other part of the sun so this kind of simple telescope is not really uh, ideal for collecting solar energy or for compressing in phase space what you would ideally like is to produce a rectangle here so we may come back to this uh, later now uh, let's look at a gravitational lens okay now uh, again same phase space axis now this is the central part of the wave front uh, i already told you when i created the dictionary between phase space curves and wave fronts that this is a diverging wave front right oh, sorry sorry other way this is a converging wave front because if you go to positive y you have negative theta now if it if it had been a perfect lens uh, this would have been a straight line right minus uh, theta would have been minus y over f but that's that's not how it is uh, the outer parts of the wave front the rays almost become parallel and actually they could even become diverging so i haven't shown that part uh, which where this curve would actually go down so now all we have to do 
is to evolve this. So this is this is by the way the wavefront after it has passed through the gravitational lens. Uh, I have to remind you that of course before the wavefront uh, passed through the gravitational lens, right, it was a nice diverging wavefront which would have been depicted like this. Right? And then after it passed through the lens, the rays near the center uh, got deviated and, and, and so on. Right. So now it's actually free propagation until it reaches the observer. So what we have to do is to take this curve and apply the shearing transformation on it. That is move every point on the curve to the right, but uh, proportional to uh, theta. Right? So, uh, and likewise move these points to the left proportional to theta. So what happens? So you can see that uh, the curvature in the center of the wavefront is increasing. That's the slope. In fact, if it becomes vertical, it will become a focus, right? So this is now what happens when the rays have uh, traveled so that the rays in the central part of the wavefront have focused. But these have not yet focused, right? Uh, if you remember the real space picture of the rays, that's exactly what happened. The rays near the center of the wavefront focused first. And uh, so technically, the intensity is actually infinite here. Yeah. No, but this is not the end of the story. No, it can keep moving. So now what happens? So now what happens is that for a given value of uh, y, so this is x has now further increased. So these points have moved further to the right. These points have moved further to the left. And uh, now in the center, the wavefront has become diverging again, right? And that's natural. If a wavefront goes through a focus, it becomes diverging. Uh, but this part is still converging and this part is vertical. So now the infinite intensity, if you take a small region here, it looks like two rays at slightly different values of theta are sitting at the same value of y. Okay. And overall between this value of y and this value of y, you have three rays. So this explains very nicely what we saw in the ray diagram that once you pass that tip, you now get a region extending from some y value to another y value where you have three rays. And if you go close to the edge of the region, you have a crowding of rays because all these rays fall very close to each other and y. So very qualitatively and geometrically, you kind of understand uh, what's going on. And if you go still further, right? Uh, the region of y where you get multiple rays increases. Um, now you may also be interested in the shape of the wavefront and uh, that's, so suppose uh, we have a distance y from the axis and let's describe the wavefront by s of y, the shape of the wavefront. Then uh, the slope of this curve is uh, ds by dy, right? That's uh, the slope of the tangent. and. Uh, that angle between the tangent and the y-axis. It will also be the angle between the normal and the x-axis. And of course, I put in a minus sign because uh, if s of y, uh, in this case, s of y is decreasing, but uh, theta is positive. So theta is ds by dy. So if someone gives you the shape of the wavefront, you can calculate theta as a function of y. But actually, what we are going to do is the other way around. Uh, we have got theta as a function of y. And they're going to reconstruct the shape of the wavefront. So here, I already told you what the wavefront was like. But here, look at the situation. You have, you have three rays. So the only way out is to have three wavefronts. Okay. And each wavefront, so <laughs> you will have to take this function and integrate it up to this point. This function integrated up to, from here to here. And this function integrated from here. So if you actually had a formula, and I've given you some exercises in the problems where you would actually carry this out. But now we are just going to use our geometric imagination. What are the wavefronts going to look like near a cup stick? So, uh, so here is a very simple wavefront. Right? It's highly curved here, but becomes more and more flat here. So here the rays are nearly parallel. So this wavefront will keep moving down. 
this piece of wavefront will keep moving up. So they will cross. And this piece of wavefront will focus and diverge. So they will form the three sheets of the wavefront. Okay, this is the, this, by the way, the coloring here is similar to the coloring in the phase space plots. So this is the same ray diagram which I showed you earlier. On that, I'm going to superpose the wavefronts. So now you can see that at any point, you have three rays which are perpendicular to the three sheets of the wavefront. So I hope, now is this just some academic thing? Actually, it has a very interesting astronomical consequences. And uh, long before gravitational lenses were actually discovered in the universe, an uh, astronomer called Rushdal, uh, who was working in the Hamburg Observatory, he wrote some papers saying that this is how gravitational lenses will behave. He understood perfectly caustic wavefronts, everything. And he said, suppose in this distant galaxy, at that time quasars were not known, uh, there's a supernova explosion. Now you will see multiple images of that supernova explosion. Right? But not only that, they will reach you at different times. So this image, for example, if you live here, this image will reach you first, this image will reach you next, and this image will reach you first. So that was 1964. I think finally in 2019, this event actually occurred. And this is very interesting because once you see the supernova explode in one image, you know that the other images are going to explode later. Okay. So now you can observe the supernova even before it exploded. Okay. So that's a really a rather brilliant piece of uh, astronomy. And he also proposed that you could use this time delay to measure uh, various parameters of the universe. So I do have uh, uh, a few more points to tell you, but they are on a slightly broader theme, right? Uh, of showing you at a deeper level what this optics mechanics uh, analogy is. So therefore, at this point, uh, I think I should take questions on what we've done uh, so far. Here we are. Uh, hi, uh, I'm yes. so many speaking. Actually, I'm uh, talking to the students. So yeah. if you have any doubts, please raise your hand or you can uh, uh, directly chat. Uh, type in the chat box or please raise your hand. Yeah, I can see a raise hand from Anand. So Anand, you can go ahead. Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, I just was wondering about the area conservation like in the phase space. Yeah. What? Like, like why is the area conserved and what exactly does it mean physically? Like, if you talked about the consequence of it, but I don't exactly think I quite understood, you know, what and why why it occurs in the first place. Like, why does the area have to be conserved? See, the uh, the conservation of the area is a straightforward consequence of the laws which govern the propagation of rays. Right? I think that part uh, should have come across, isn't it? Now, of course, I didn't do the most general uh, propagation of rays. So I could have proved the area propagation from uh, in a more general case where the refractive index is not that of a thin lens. Now, if you want to know its physical meaning, uh, both in dynamics and in optics, in some sense, uh, this area represents the number of states of the system, right? And imagine, think of the opposite situation. Suppose that whole area shrank to a point extreme example. Then it's as if multiple states are being attracted to the same state. And that also means that the process is not reversible. So in some sense, at a deep level, I would say this area conservation reflects the fact that individual states are mapped to individual states. And this is a reversible evolution. I think we emphasize reversibility in the context of optics, also holds in mechanics. So if you're asking for a physical explanation, that is it. If you want a mathematical explanation, uh, then you have to look at those differential equations and uh, verify that they conserve area. So, uh, maybe I can put up some exercise on that. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
Professor, uh, could you like you know share some resources on uh, more resources on this optics uh, mechanics analogy? Like I've never found anything like this. Oh, actually, uh, uh, this is typically there in uh, books on advanced mechanics. So it's there in, uh, for example, Goldstein's book. Um, but the only thing is that you have to, you know, go through the whole book, which typically one does in MSc. Uh, I, yeah, I, I will try and share. Uh, if there's a more concise account somewhere, I will try and share that. Definitely. And uh, maybe a little bit of history now that you've asked that uh, this more or less is the way the history happened. You had Fermat's principle, you had wavefronts and all that. And then uh, at some point, uh, people realized that this applies to mechanics. And this was pursued uh, to the full extent by this person called Hamilton. So he emphasized, so his viewpoint is that you don't think of, uh, you know, second order equations for the position, the Newtonian way of looking at things. You think of first order equations <coughs> for the pair position and momentum. Okay. And he showed that those equations Number one, they follow from the principle of least action. And uh, number two, uh, they uh, actually conserve, they are nice properties like conservation of phase volume and so on. By the way, if, if you want to impress people, you can, this conservation of phase volume in mechanics is called Liouville's theorem. Okay. It's proved sometime in 1850s. It also has a lot of significance in thermodynamics and so on. So, Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so I was asking about that. Uh, you showed that in the phase space diagram, inside mm -hmm. the caustic there will be three images, and on the caustic there will be um, on that two images will converge to one images. And so, is there any fundamental way, um, rather than the phase space, to see that there inside the caustic there will be exactly two rays, like Fermat principle or something? Mm -hmm. I mean, from Fermat principle, can we reach there? <coughs> See, in a way, everything that we have said is follows from Fermat's principle, right? But however, uh, I have put one problem. Uh, I would say it's actually more a geometric result. Hmm? Let us say you have a family of straight lines. Hmm? And this family has an envelope. Hmm? So it is nothing particularly to do with uh, optics. Then this is a general property that... Uh, Envelope is a curve uh, to which every element of this family is tangent. Hmm? And uh, whatever properties you mentioned, that the angle between two of the straight lines uh, goes to zero. And then when you go outside the envelope, uh, there are no rays at all. Actually, in our case, there's a third ray which comes from some different part of the wavefront. But, right? So all these are really geometric properties of the envelope. And I think problem number two in your setup is a kind of revision of envelope. So uh, perhaps it's a more general property than just optics. It's a, it's a geometric property of families of curves which have an envelope. Ah. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, uh, Siddharth, go ahead, please. Uh, sir, I would like to ask that uh, in the beginning of the slide, you showed a general relativity formula for the bending of light by uh, quasars. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we did it by the phase space method. So uh, if we do that uh, gravitational lensing problem by general relativity or by this classical phase space method, is there any essential difference in the results or the method? Uh, OK. So uh, I think the answer to that would be that phase space is such a general concept that it continues to be valid in general relativity. Uh, so in general relativity, uh, there is a principle that light rays follow what is called a geodesic. Oh, yes. So that's the kind of generalization of Fermat's principle to general relativity. So uh, that equation for the light ray can be written in a phase space form. So I don't think there's any fundamental difference between the two ways of doing things. Oh. Except that uh, we tre really treat a general relativity as a black box. We said, uh, the, by the way, the bending is not by the quasar. The yes, quasar is the light source and the galaxy does the bending. The dark matter in the galaxy does the bending. Yes, sir. So uh, all the GR took place inside the galaxy. 
and that we simply said uh, causes the deflection and causes the distortion of the wave field. So uh, whatever we did was happening more or less in flat space time, and the GR was all bundled into the deflection formula. Okay, sir. Hi, it's it's not a conceptual pro, uh, question, but when you when you you were talking about the simulation you did uh, to produce caustics on the computer, yep. uh, can you can you walk us through that simulation because oh, I'd okay. like my, uh, the people in my group to do it if okay. they're willing. Go okay. so, uh, ahead. So let me uh, share the screen. Maybe share the whole. So uh, basically. I didn't draw these rays. So you basically uh, generate, if you call this coordinate Y and this coordinate X, you generate equally spaced rays in Y. Each one you find where it intersects the mirror. Uh, find the normal, follow the law of reflection, draw that ray. If it hits the mirror again, repeat. So actually this figure uh, is not complete because I limited myself, I think, to two or three bounces. But in principle, you can have an infinite number of bounces. If the ray is very tangential, it can go on bouncing off the inside. So actually, the full caustics uh, of, a, of a spherical mirror are very interesting because of this uh, mode, which in acoustics is called whispering gallery. But I think with an actual teacup, I have seen up to these two. Hmm? So basically, it's just following that. You just take a grid in Y, evolve the rays, and at, solve for the intersections with the mirror and join them with straight lines. OK. Thank you. Uh, my question might be pedantic, but uh, when you refer to the evolution in phase space, mm. you called it shearing transformation, not shearing propagation. Like, what was the reason of using transformation? Because when I think of transformation, I usually think of changing the coordinate act itself, not just the propagation. Mm. OK, uh, the way I thought about it, and you can decide what's the appropriate term is that we are uh, we have this bundle of rays which is undergoing propagation refraction going through lenses or gravitational lenses then we are cutting the bundle by a number of planes perpendicular to the axis and those planes are labeled by x as we go along the axis so on each value of x you have a phase space right so strictly speaking you can say these are different phase spaces one for the first value of x one for the second value of x but what we can say is there's a single phase space and as a function of x, which is like time, the points move around in this phase space. The points representing the rays move around. So in that sense, it's a transformation. So I would use both the words. The propagation of rays from one plane to another, if represented in phase space, is a map of the phase space onto itself. And in fact, it's an area preserving map. So uh, I hope that clarifies the, what you Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would call it semantic rather than pedantic, but yeah. Yeah, yeah sir. Uh, also, has it uh, anything to do with canonical transformation? Phase uh, it has everything to do with canonical transformation. <laughs> the, the set of transformations in a phase space which preserve some nice properties, including area preservation, but more properties. See, in the case of one plus one dimension, area preservation makes it canonical. But in, in a real optics, you would have two directions perpendicular to the axis. And then there are additional uh, nice properties, which uh, unfortunately I did not have time to go into. Sure, sir. Thank you. Mm. Sir, that means that uh, the parallelogram, in uh, in addition to being shared, is also propagating in phase space linearly. Yeah, yeah, you're right. The whole thing also moves to the right. So the shear only refers to the change in shape, but even the centroid of the parallelogram moves. Okay, so thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, next is Pranav. Please go ahead. So, so uh, I had a small observation. So, I just wanted to you know, listen, uh, listen to your thoughts on that. So, uh, like the two uh, transformations we have seen, uh, the shears are in uh, like two mutually perpendicular directions, right? And uh, as we are simply considering a two dimensional space, uh, so these two transformations, I mean, what I see is like uh, any transformation can be made up of 
uh, can be composed of these two transformations because they, there are two perpendicular uh, directions right so can we you know think of the evolution of uh, I mean, the, the uh, propagation of a light ray uh, just as uh, a combination of free propagation and uh, lens interactions mm. uh, yes but uh, i have to say this is confined to linear transformations okay uh, but uh, canonic area preserving transformations need not be uh, only linear transformations for example if you do the mirage problem in phase space it will be a non linear transformation but if you are talking of linear transformations and those are the ones which uh, one is repeatedly taught in uh, elementary optics courses so all those optical systems can be obtained in fact again let me uh, tell you about another problem the very first problem i have set uh, in the thing we have written these transformations in terms of matrices because they are linear transformations of two variables y and theta so we have asked you to uh, do the entire telescope problem by matrix multiplication so yes you're right i think uh, in fact uh, there are some nice papers also showing how a general optical system can be built up from these transformations you have to do some nice matrix algebra thank you sir okay sure yeah so uh, he's uh, the person is asking can you kindly elaborate on how to calculate sy since it is a factor of y what are the limits of the piece wise integrals for different sheets of the wavefronts ah okay yeah. that's yeah i you. think this is best appreciated in the context of a concrete uh, problem but uh, basically one has to ensure that there is continuity between the different sheets of the wave front okay uh, yeah so i'll just uh, give a kind of general answer that you can see if you uh, you can pick any value of y which you like and if you pick a different value the entire wave front will be displaced forward or backward but its shape will not change okay uh, so ideally i mean technically i would say go from so any point at any point uh, value of y you can define as to be zero but with that initial condition uh, there is no more uncertainty because uh, because you are really moving along this continuous curve in phase space right so uh, so you will get uh, but uh, there is one problem where one has actually worked out the two sheets of the wave front and uh, how they uh, meet on the caustic uh, so maybe i maybe i can at least state the result hmm? yeah so the result is Uh, it's quite interesting. If you take one axis along this, make this a straight line, and ask what function is this? This function is a fractional power, uh, power three by two. So it's not an obvious result, but it comes by integrating y to the half. Y to the half is the angle of the wave front, uh, angle of the ray, and if you integrate that, you get y to the three by two. So this particular diagram is actually obtained by Uh, integrating in the uh, previous curve yeah so you can start the integral anywhere and you integrate everywhere along this curve so what will happen now is you will actually uh, when you are integrating uh, theta with respect to y right at some point uh, it will if you express y as a function of the uh, this parameter it will start going back pranav Seems to have his hand up. Sorry, I was talking again to oh, muted oh, mic. Okay. How how okay. it is happening? I mean, my mic is unmuted, but it's happening automatically. So I was saying uh, there is another question from YouTube. So uh, the person is asking, can you can you please explain the computational simulation of parallel beams reflected by a spherical mirror? Hmm. I thought I I just did no. Uh, yeah. Maybe in not great detail, but. Hmm. Uh, No, it's it's really very straightforward. Yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't even have called it a computer simulation. It's an intersection of a straight line with a circle, finding the normal at that point, applying the law of reflection, finding the slope of the new straight line, and finding the intersection of that with the circle, and uh, you just keep going. So, and then of course you actually plot those straight lines. So. It's, and you have to do it for a whole family of rays you shouldn't do it for just one ray maybe if i can find my old code i will put it up 
<laughs> really very simple. Okay, so any more questions? Uh, the idea is uh, not to go out to the breakout rooms now uh, because I had a few more things to share with you to kind of round off the geometric optics part of the course. So can I begin on that? Uh, yes, sure. Yeah. So uh, this part is will be much more sketchy, but giving you an outline of various uh, ways in which one could pursue the topics in this course. So we will initially stick to this uh, concept that uh, there's a preferred axis and rays are nearly parallel to that. Okay. Instead, there's a formal name for this. It's called uh, paraxial optics. So Instead of earlier, we just said y is a function of x, but now we say y and z, one more axis. So now we have planes perpendicular to the x axis, yz plane, and uh, the state of a ray is defined by giving both x and y, and also now two angles, right? Uh, essentially, you have to give the value of uh, dy by dx as well as dz by dx. So then uh, if you want to apply Fermat's principle, you have to multiply the refractive index n by the uh, distance traveled, dl. Mm -hmm. So that form we need a formula for the length along the ray. Now this is the exact formula, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared whole to the power of half. And in this paraxial context, uh, these angles dy by dx and dz by dx are pretty small. Okay, So therefore you do this usual trick of dividing by dx squared and of course taking the square root of dx squared outside. So then it becomes, and because x is our independent variable, so it becomes uh, dl becomes dx multiplied by uh, the square root of this quantity. And then since these two are small, the square root of 1 plus epsilon is 1 plus half epsilon. Okay. And then uh, we also, uh, okay, let me, yeah. We also wrote the refractive index as one plus N1, which was kind of appropriate for atmospheric optics. Mm -hmm. um, and let's also assume that N1 is small, because if N1 becomes large, then sooner or later, the rays will deviate from the paraxial condition, okay? So this is still an, uh, so now when we multiply out uh, these terms, we expand this so that we get half dy by dx squared and half dz dx squared. Then you, uh, we simplify this expression. Of course, the biggest term is one into one, mm -hmm. but actually we don't have to worry about that term because one into one integrated with respect to dx is xb minus xa. And that's not going to depend on the path. Okay, it just depends on the two endpoints. So if you vary the path and you say that uh, this quantity should be stationary, you don't have to worry about the first term. So therefore, you have three more terms, right? And the smallest term will be n1 multiplied by the small angles, squares of the small angles. So that we neglect. So in paraxial optics, this is what Fermat's principle looks like. You have uh, integral to dx, which is n1 and then half of dy dx whole squared and half of dz dx optics mechanics analogy which we saw we had uh, log n being minus of the potential okay but when you have one plus a small quantity taking log of that is same as writing n1 log of one plus x is approximately x right so the potential uh, so if we now want to use the optics mechanics analogy in reverse mechanics, right? Then you replace this by minus the potential per unit mass. And this again is the kinetic energy per unit mass, right? Because in the analogy, X gets replaced by time. Uh, are people uh, able to hear me and see me? Hello? Yes, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My screen showed that the internet was misbehaving. So this, okay. if, you, if you multiply everything by M, then N1 becomes the potential and uh, this becomes kinetic energy, right? So therefore,
purely in mechanics, there is applying the analogy in reverse, there is something called action, which is the integral of kinetic energy minus potential energy with respect to time. And this is to be extremized by varying the path. And of course, now since we have uh, actual mechanical system, we move in three dimensions, or if not more. Yeah. I mean, if there are multiple particles, you will have more. So this goes by the name of Hamilton's principle. Right? Now, uh, so that is where uh, advanced mechanics texts begin. They just define a quantity kinetic energy minus potential energy, and one often wonders why you're doing that. Right. But from optics, that's a very natural thing. And uh, the first thing you do in a mechanics course is to show that you will get Newton's law in familiar cases. But from this, you can also get phase space. And you can also uh, get Hamilton's equations, which are these two first order equations, which tell you how x and v or x and p vary. I'm not writing them down in detail. But what I would like to tell you is we have already seen the optical equivalent. And especially there is this theory which is considered uh, you know, the most advanced topic in a classical mechanics course. Right? And I have to confess that uh, when it was taught to me out of uh, Goldstein's book, when I was at MSc, it didn't make any sense. I mean, since you are in MSc, you learn to do the algebra. But it really made sense only after uh, learning about the optical analogy. And it, I think it should be part of the teaching because Hamilton himself reached it via optics, right? So I will just tell you a little bit about what the optical equivalent is of this hamilton jacobi theory. You've seen this slide before. Huh? Theta is dsdy. Uh, and uh, so in mechanics, that tells you that you have a function s. Here, s uh, is a function of x and y, right? And uh, in mechanics, Right. Similarly, it would be a function of time and the coordinates. Okay. And if you differentiate with respect to coordinates, it gives you the momentum. So that is one. But that's not very useful unless you have an equation which tells you what S is. Now in optics, that equation is very clear. Because S is the integral of NDL. Right? So ds dx will be if I change x by a certain amount, the length dl changes by more than that, right? It changes by n divided by cos theta. Because dx divided by dl is cos theta. So then you use your paraxial approximation. n becomes 1 plus n1. Cos theta becomes 1 minus theta squared by 2. So then ds dx becomes 1, uh, which is not so interesting. You know? I mean, and then you have n1. And then you have theta squared by 2 which is the kinetic energy. So in fact, this is the total energy, right? As it turns out. So this equation in the mechanics context would tell you that you have this function S, which is a function of coordinates and time. And its partial derivative with respect to time is given by taking the energy, I mean, basically. So uh, this is a very interesting theory. And uh, I'm not telling you more about it. But uh, some of you definitely will go ahead and read some advanced mechanics books. And as I said, it looks very mysterious, but it's a, a straightforward outcome of uh, the optics mechanics analogy. And uh, this is my last slide. What are the things that, you know, given many more hours, one would have talked about, or perhaps given no COVID, one would have talked about, is uh, do the optics itself in two plus one. And actually, more interesting things happen. Like, for example, you could have focusing in one direction, but not in the other direction. Now, that is what is called astigmatism. Many of us suffer from it. Right? Okay, we will do that. Yeah. And even gravitational lenses should really be done in two dimensions. And uh, I showed you the simplest case where you have three images, but there are cases with five images, there are cases where you have a ring. And what I have done is uh, have put up a, a kind of review article. It's written long ago, but the optics has not changed. Uh, which is at the level, at least the initial part of the article is at the same level as this course. Maybe it gets a little beyond that. It gives further references. It's put up in the Moodle. Then let me tell you that uh, in laboratory optics, 
including in your mobile phone, theta is not small. Uh, so you have to do optics properly with large angles. And likewise, if you are uh, you know building solar collectors, of course, angle of the rays when they come from the sun is small. But when you focus them with a large mirror or a large lens onto something which you want to melt or cook or something like that, then theta is large. But the phase space still goes through. But instead of using theta, you have to use sine theta. Right? Uh, I mean, I'm just telling you that much, but there's actually more to it. Because in two dimensions, you have, uh, you have to take what are called direction cosines. That is the dot product between a unit vector along the ray and the y and z directions. Then uh, there is thing which I mentioned in the first lecture, which is called non-imaging optics. Now you noticed when we looked at the telescope, right? uh, it didn't do a perfect job of taking the uh, initial phase space distribution and compressing it to a nice rectangle. But that's what you would like to do. You do not, on the one hand, want to waste any light. Uh, and you also do not want to waste, if you are going to heat an object or collect uh, uh, onto a solar cell. So you want all the light to nicely fill the entire area of the uh, target, whatever it is, a solar cell, a sample to be melted, or you know some food to be cooked. So a very efficient solar character uh, solves a different kind of problem. Take a finite region of phase space, and map it onto a finite collector or detector. It doesn't matter if one point maps to a point, I mean, if one all rays come to a focus or not, that doesn't matter. And this is a branch of optics, which I told you, it was a big surprise developed in the 1960s by a person called Roland Winston. And I'll see if I can put up some reference on that. I haven't done that yet. And finally, if you're a, you know, mathematically inclined, there is the mathematics of transformations and phase space. And a lot of the standard stuff was done in 19th century by various people. But this branch again became a very important branch in the 20th century, even the late 20th century. It goes by the name of symplectic uh, geometry. And there are very interesting theorems. But these theorems become really interesting when you go to higher dimensions. Okay? Because in higher dimensions, it's not just preserving the volume, right? There are more constraints. So I just thought uh, I'll give you this kind of view of what lies beyond. So these three lectures have been a bit like uh, these tourist operators who will pack you into a bus, take you to Mysore, show you five or six things and bring you back. And the aim, if you uh, find it really interesting, is you have to go back yourself and explore what you find interesting. So that's the purpose of uh, this. Then let me also briefly introduce the problems which you will plunge into. Uh -huh. How do I do that? I go to window and I go to problems. Yeah. So uh, this time the problems are handwritten. Yeah. So this you have already seen, right? It shows you the two kinds of telescopes. But I now want you to do it by matrices. Right? That's the most economical way of looking at linear transformations. So this is the transformation y prime is equal to y minus uh, x over f into theta, right? Oh, this is not 1 over f, which, uh, yeah, 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 okay. And then theta prime is, uh, yeah, sorry, y prime is just y, sorry, for the thin lens, y prime is just y, but uh, theta prime is equal to theta, uh, which is and uh, minus y over f. And the free propagation is represented by this matrix. y prime is uh, y plus x into theta, theta prime is theta. So now uh, do uh, three matrices, right? One for this lens, one for this lens, one for propagation by f1 plus f2. So I've asked you to do that. It, it's very nice. And the nice thing is you'll be able to do both the kinds of telescopes together by just changing the sign of f2. Now, this uh, problem too is just a revision of the concept of envelope. Okay. Uh, you can think of it in two ways. Either you have a family of straight lines, you, you look for a curve which is tangent to it, or you take an existing curve and draw a family of tangents to it. Yeah. Now, uh, if you want to do these things uh, properly using calculus, the method is as follows. Right. You have a family of curves, need not even be straight lines. 
So any one of them is f of x, y equal to 0, but there's a parameter t. For example, in the case of these tangents, the parameter could be the place where the tangent uh, touches the curve. Okay. So you have family f of x, y, t equals 0. And then our intuitive concept is that two of these rays will intersect at a point very close to the caustic. And as you uh, reduce the angle between these rays, as you bring these two points closer and closer to each other, this point of intersection moves to the envelope or to the caustic. So that means this quantity should be 0. And for t plus delta t should also be 0, t plus delta t being the neighboring rays. So that means f is 0 and the partial derivative of f respect to t is 0. Okay? So this is the recipe for calculating uh, the envelope of a family of curves. So I've given you an example. Uh, taken a parabola. And uh, so this problem is just uh, really uh, revising some basic calculus, which, uh, sorry, many of you may have seen. Yeah? Okay. So I have asked you to... Uh, First, write down all the lines which are tangent to the parabola using the slope of the parabola. And then writing from that family, get back to the parabola by using this recipe, f and df dt being zero. Now, incidentally, this is also pretty much the behavior of caustic rays near a caustic, which we saw. So you can use the same work that you did here, You're using the same family. And you study the angle of intersection, study the intensity, study the shape of the wavefront, and all that. So all that you can do. And the shape of the wavefront leads to uh, actually a kind of differential equation. Because the wavefront has to be orthogonal to the rays, right? So we basically find the slope of the ray. Uh, if you call it m, you go slope of the uh, wavefront is minus 1 over m. So I'm not giving you the details. And you get a pretty uh, ugly looking differential equation, even though the parabola has a beautiful curve. So I made some approximations. And you get this 5, 4 by 3, y to the 3 by 3. Now I think. I would be very happy if uh, in the limited time left, one is able to handle these two problems. But just in case, I have added one more. Hmm? What we discussed so far is some general point on the wavefront. But this is a very special point. Because here, the curvature is a maximum. And on either side, the curvature becomes less. Hmm? So I have uh, created for you a wavefront, uh, which has that property. And then I'm asking you to find the normals to that wavefront, which are the rays, and find the envelope. Okay. Um, so you can, uh, this is a lot of fun if you like doing that kind of thing. Okay. So this is really a brief introduction to the problems. And uh, maybe, uh, uh, so that's where, so I'll bid goodbye to you uh, as far as geometrical optics is concerned and uh, put on a different hat and a different personality and start talking to you about wave optics when we meet next. So right now, uh, if there's any quick question I can take regarding this uh, short part, then... Uh, uh, yeah, Rajaram, I have a question actually. Yeah. So uh, for the second problem, the last part is not quite visible in the ah. thing that you have sent actually. Oh, is that right? Let me, let me go back. Yeah, just go back and check. No, this is... Mm, okay, okay. Uh, I should... Uh, I should. Uh, second the, oh, the bottom part has got cut, is it? Huh. Yeah, bottom part. Uh, let us check that. The, and after that, yeah. So the missing sentence is check that the recipe works giving back y equal to x squared. So see, you found the tangents to the parabola. Now someone, suppose someone just gave you the tangents and didn't give you the parabola, you should be able to use the recipe for envelope. That is, write it in the form f of x, y, t equal to 0, uh, differentiate with respect to t, uh, put that also equal to 0. And then you have two equations uh, with x, y, and t. So in principle, you can eliminate t and find a connection between x and y, which will be the equation of the envelope. So that's all it is. It simply check that the recipe works. Giving back y equal to minus x squared. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Huh. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay then. Uh, have fun. <laughs>